Well, good morning, everybody. And welcome to Park Community Church Systematic Theology class. Um, Steve Kobo, I'm one of the pastors here, and I uh, have the privilege of being your teacher. And I am a fill-in for the Silver Fox himself, and so I'll be working through his notes this morning. And so hopefully, uh, hopefully he's done his homework. No, I'm kidding. Um, I want to go ahead and get started. We got a lot to cover and not a whole lot of time to do so. And so I'm gonna pray uh, and then we'll jump in. The two things that we're probably gonna focus in on today, and so I wanna recommend that uh, you do diligent work in reading that book. I think it's one of the most accessible uh, systematic theology books that uh, are available, uh, the most accessible that I've ever read. And so we wanna focus on the arguments for the existence of God uh, and uh, the doctrine of the Trinity uh, this morning. So uh, with that said, let me pray and we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, we pause this morning to tune our hearts to you, not simply to talk about the way that you've revealed yourself, but God, ultimately to worship to sit at your feet and be reminded that the God of the universe says that he loves us, that he cherishes us in Christ. And so, Father, would you, uh, through your Holy Spirit, in our time together, uh, help us worship. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are a couple of questions that uh, many scholars talk about as it comes to knowledge of the world and uh, religious knowledge. And those two questions are, is there a God uh, and what is God like? Uh, so in other words, uh, how can we know that there's a God? Uh, and then uh, what are his attributes? What are his, uh, what are his characteristics? So if you would go ahead and turn to Romans chapter one with me. If you are new to the scriptures, and you can't jump around the Bible that, that well, uh, ain't no shame in the game. Uh, I'm going to uh, recommend that you utilize uh, a uh, company that Ryan Campbell works for called Google, uh, and just type in the passage and pull it up. Um, and so we're gonna do a, a little bit of that. I'm gonna try to uh, jump around, so I may call on you to pull up something if you can't do it quick in your mind, uh, Google it, and um, Joe would probably recommend against that, but as you grow, stop Googling things. God bless you. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 24. So when it comes to the scriptures and the existence of God, uh, the scriptures assume that there is a God. If you were to turn to uh, the, psalm, uh, the Psalms, uh, the scripture would say, uh, the fool says in his heart, there, there is no God. Now, we live in a space that is uh, post-enlightenment. So if uh, once you get 16, 1700, uh, years in the game, then you get further uh, west outside of Africa and uh, Asia. There needs to be a rational approach or reason needs to be used, the age of reason. Uh, science needs to be used in order to prove that something exists. So when it comes to the scriptures, though, in a pre-enlightenment space, it was assumed that God existed. And one of the things that Romans chapter 1 teaches us is that when we look at creation, uh, and we'll get into some of the philosophical arguments that people have made over the course of the centuries uh, as to the existence of God, but when you look at creation uh, and you see the mountain, uh, I'm getting ready to go out to uh, California and the Pacific Palisades, and uh, you know, whenever you go on vacation to whatever cool place that you go to, uh, and you watch the sunset or you watch the stars come up at night, uh, essentially the scriptures articulate that those things 
are basically an advertisement for the obviousness of the existence of God, right? Uh, the, we'll get to this, but the teleological argument um, for the existence of God in, in philosophy is that, like, I would never look at my Seiko watch and say, this watch just appeared. Uh, there, is no, uh, there is no creator to this watch. It just arrived. And uh, one of the things that I think is helpful, especially as maybe some of you uh, go to have conversations with your, uh, your coworkers and you feel afraid of talking about God with the person who says that they're an atheist or they're, uh, they're agnostic, the, the reality of, of how they're interpreting the world is very much just a post-enlightenment, post-age of reason, uh, Western American perspective. Uh, and pre-enlightenment, there's always been sort of the obvious nature of if something looks like it has design, then it has, it has a designer. Um, and so it's not that ridiculous that you believe in a God looking at all the intricate details of the human experience and all of the things that have to go together in order for you to have woken up this morning uh, and taking uh, a breath into your lungs and your heart is still beating and the temperature of your body having to be the exact uh, temperature in order for you to uh, continue on living, right? All of those different things and even the, the distance between the sun and the uh, earth and all of those different things. Uh, essentially what Paul is arguing, arguing in Romans chapter one is that nobody looks at that stuff and says, nah, now, there's no God. Now, what Paul's argument is in Romans chapter 1 is that every human being, even if they would say they're agnostic or atheist, there's something deep within their souls that says, no, nah, there's, there's something there. The, the, the thing about it is, is that sin has so corrupted our natures that what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 is that we suppress that truth. Uh, we suppress those things. And one of the things that I think is really interesting <clears throat> as I have grown in my understanding of what it means to uh, worship God and to, you know, even the first commandment to have no other gods besides the God of the scriptures, right, is that I often find myself trusting in created things to bring me lasting satisfaction, comfort, joy, and peace. So... Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that they suppress the truth and they worship and serve created things. Now that could be, uh, you know, in that particular generation and time period, there was actual uh, religious institutions that were a part of them worshiping and creating, uh, worshiping uh, and serving created things. But in our society, we take it out of uh, the religious spectrum because of the age of reason and the enlightenment and now we begin to uh, worship things like uh, romantic relationships. There's a show on Netflix right now. I was watching, my wife made me watch this show last night. It made me cringe the whole time. It made me uncomfortable and I was anxious the entire time. It's like the reverse of the, ten, of the Tinder movement. So basically like you talk to somebody through a wall and like then you fall in like over the course of time you go on dates with people that you cannot see and then you build a, a connection with them and then at the end of whatever time that you say man you know what I want to marry this person just through the connection and not having seen them it's like a reverse tinder so like you're not it's not everything's not based on like how you present yourself in a picture and uh, at the end of that they propose and they, they, uh, they meet each other for the very first time, and now they're getting ready to get married. And ain't nothing wrong with that. Do what, do what you like. <laughs> Point being is that there's so much about these people's lives and our lives that is built around romantic relationships. And uh, dare I say, the worship of love or being in love with love. Uh, and so that is what I believe an example or a modern, modern day example of what Paul would say, worshiping 
and serving a created thing. Um, it, is, uh, it is bowing down to, even in sort of like a, uh, not a physical way, but in a spiritual way, to the thing that you love the most. So when you think of, of worship, you need to picture the idea of like, man, I, if this thing was taken away from me, if this one thing was taken away from me, I, I couldn't go on. And I think what Paul is saying is that every one of us has that in us. And when it comes to the commandments of the creator, uh, he, he is saying, I'm the only one that deserves that. And yet you guys keep on going on uh, worshiping and serving created things. And so he's like, no, you, you know that there's a God. You're created in my image. And you just keep going back to things that are created uh, to serve them, believing that, so really, in essence, if you were to speak to somebody, if, if you were, I was agnostic before I became a follower of Christ, or at least I felt like I had gotten to that space of, it, I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure if God exists, and if he does, I'm not sure what he's like. And um, when you get to that space, the, the reality is we're all worshiping and serving something. Um, and regardless if you're an agnostic or a, an atheist, that is a part of the DNA of who you are. So when you go to work and you talk to that person who's an agnostic or an atheist, there's gonna be something uh, that you notice in their lives um, or something that, you know, in conversation when y'all are like, you know, hopefully you've built enough rapport with somebody and made yourself uh, an incredibly charitable person and, and gracious and kind um, that you can have a conversation. And when they're like, yo, this Tinder hookup thing is just not working. Um, you know, you can kind of say like, hey, like, man, what if life isn't just about romantic relationships? Like, like actually, you know, and you know, in Romans chapter one, it's, it's a part of that. That's the essence of us moving to different things to worship and serve created things. So anyways, the scripture assumes that. So when you come to scripture, it assumes that there, uh, that there is a God. Let me just make sure. Can somebody pull up Job 11.7 for me? And Job 26.14. So the whole point being that the scripture assumes that there, uh, that there is a God. Uh, over the course of time, uh, there have been different philosophical arguments as it pertains to the existence of God uh, that people have come up with in order to help uh, others think well around them. I think a number of them, um, you know, the moral argument, the um, teleological argument come post-enlightenment, the um, ontological argument comes earlier on, and cosmological argument comes earlier on. So uh, if you're taking notes, the cosmological argument uh, about the existence of God um, is this idea that comes from the idea that since the universe exists, it must have been caused by something beyond itself. For this reason, the argument sometimes is called the argument from first cause and relies on a philosophical principle, every effect has a cause. So since the universe exists, it must have been caused by something beyond itself is kind of the essence of that argument. The next one is the teleological argument. Uh, this argument derives from uh, the Greek word telos, meaning end or purpose, and is based on the idea that there is a hierarchy of designs from simple to complex, and that there must be a master designer uh, beyond all of them. So when you heard me uh, talk about the watch and talk about our own human existence and saying like we wouldn't just assume that this watch came from nothing, um, it just appeared, uh, that would fit under the title of the teleological argument for the existence of God. So Thomas Aquinas was uh, the one who popularized, so that would be, uh, what is Thomas Aquinas, 1200 AD? No? Any scholars in the room? The Middle Ages Thomas Aquinas uh, lived 
So the argument derives from the Greek word telos, meaning end or purpose, and is based on the idea that there is a hierarchy of designs from simple to complex and that there must be a master designer behind them all. Thomas Aquinas used a form of the argument uh, in his, uh, I can't pronounce that Latin word, or five ways is what it means, by observing that there is an observable order in the universe amongst objects that cannot be attributed to the objects themselves, but to an intelligent being. Then there's the moral argument, and this argument was popularized by Immanuel Kant. Uh, if you've taken, if anybody took Western Civ uh, in college, you probably came across Immanuel Kant. Uh, it relies on the human sense of morality. One way of stating it is, there is, a universe, uh, there is a universal moral law which requires a universal lawgiver who is absolutely good since the standard of all good must be completely good. Um, and one of the reasons why I like this argument and I oftentimes bring it up is that um, there, our, our perspective of good and bad um, outside of there being a higher being who says there is good and bad is completely subjective. So in other words, if, I don't know, if the, the cab driver, I don't know, if, um, let me find an example that's not entirely terrible and evil. Um, yeah, if, say for instance, you got a coworker, and they say, yeah, uh, I just, I cheat on my girlfriend. I know that she doesn't, uh, she thinks that we're in a, uh, in a exclusive relationship, uh, but I cheat on my girlfriend, and I feel bad, I feel bad about it, right? Now, if there is no God who says to love each other as, as you love yourself, uh, then really the, the nature of the objective idea that that's morally okay, um, or it, yeah, it's, it falls apart, right? But, but if there is no God, if, if there is no moral lawgiver, then what, uh, what you do or what you don't do is a matter of your own subjective, you know, ideas of things. So the, the issue that I have with a lot of uh, people who uh, argue for uh, the non-existence of God is that there's still this, this, uh, this belief in a strong belief in right and wrong and, and justice and, uh, and injustice. And, uh, and yet, if there is no God, then I, I, don't, I don't see the, the, the point of it. So uh, another reason why I think the, the moral law is interesting is that a lot of people will look to the moral law to, um, to look down on the existence of God. Uh, if, if there is a God, then why does he allow suffering to happen, right? And so there, that is a position of moral authority on our part to assume that we understand that there is some kind of, of moral standard that is not subjective. Uh, and, and yet... Um, there has to be a God in order for that to be a, a moral standard. Otherwise, everything is completely subjective. There is no such thing. Uh, if there is no God, there is no such thing as something that is uh, right and wrong. It's, it's, it's all morally neutral if there is no lawgiver who actually says that this is right and wrong or good or bad. If, if it's all based on like our evolutionary process of things. Um, what else? And this is, this is also, like some people will say, um, you know, I can't believe in Christianity because uh, I can't believe a God who uh, allows suffering. And one of the things that I think is cool about Christianity or one of the things that I find great solace in Christianity in is that Jesus Christ uh, was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And so the picture of Christianity apart from every other religion and uh, apart from every other worldview is that the God that we worship actually experienced grief and sorrow. 
um, he he was very well aware of it and um, and for somebody like me like my mom passed away in October um, there is no other like what what else would give me any kind of comfort than the fact that like the God of the universe who un like literally understands what what I feel and identifies uh, with me in it right and so I, even if that God yeah, the the whole the whole idea that if God is is exists, then uh, he shouldn't allow suffering. Um, I think falls apart in the sense of like, if there is no God, then there is no such thing as is evil or good. So there's that's a completely subjective argument. But but if there is, uh, and God is still good, and there is a moral argument, and and based on what the gods that have been revealed or the religions that have been revealed, which one of those religions identifies with my grief and sorrow um, the most? And I think Christianity by far is the only one that, um, that sort of just lifts itself off, of, off the pages and rises to the top. Um, so that's the moral argument. The last one is the ontological argument. Uh, Anselm of Canterbury lived 1033 to 1109. Uh, he's regarded as the first Christian philosopher to formulate it, and Anselm became, uh, began his argument with a definition. He said, God is something of which nothing greater can be thought. It is greater to exist in reality than in the mind, and therefore God must exist. Otherwise, he would not be the greatest being possible. This form of the argument relies on the premise that existence is, necessary, is a necessary part of perfection. Haven't quite fully understood the ontological argument myself. So God is something of which nothing greater can be thought. So these are all uh, philosophical ideas that people have, theories that people have come up with to prove the existence of God. Some of them I find super helpful. Uh, the moral argument is one that I come back to often. Um, the idea of um, worship in the sense of what we see in creation and the teleological argument is something that I come back to regularly uh, in the sense of like I don't look at my watch and say that man this thing just appeared um, there had to be a designer um, and I, I, I often go back to Romans chapter 1 and think through like what is what is this thing that we've built our lives on? Is it God? Is it sex? Is it, um, is it money? Is it power? Is it love or the idea of love? Um, and just trying to narrow down uh, which thing that somebody build, has built their life on. Or if you go through the ups and downs with somebody, um, going back to the conversation around like, and I feel like you're moving from one thing to the other and building your life on things that aren't going to provide what you think that they're going to provide. And then we can have a conversation about the one that we believe that can provide to them what they are looking for. So there are a couple of ways that people describe how if, um, if the scripture assumes that God exists and then here are the philosophical arguments for the ex existence of God, now what is he like? Uh, if, uh, if he does exist, then what is, what is he like? So um, the scripture argues that uh, if somebody would pull up Psalm 19 and verse 1 for me, the scripture argues that based on uh, creation, we can look and see that God exists. Um, and that is called general revelation. General revelation. Psalm 19 and 1. So that is what theologians call general revelation. This is, uh, we can look at those things and say, man, God exists. But then in order to know that God, to uh, experience that God, we need something that uh, scholars call special revelation. Um, special revelation. So now, through the scriptures, we believe that God has uh, revealed himself 
And w one of the things that I think is interesting, and, and y'all already talked about inerrancy and the canon of Scripture and stuff like that. Did that happen already? That was what? Oh, y'all had to cancel. Okay, okay. Well, good then. I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God or breathed out by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Scripture articulates that, um, that what has been revealed uh, has been revealed by God himself for us to, to know him uh, and to love him and worship him. Um, uh, 2 Peter 1 says that no prophecy came by uh, the will of man. Like, m people didn't create this thing. There's, there's no prophecy that came uh, that, that's in this scripture that people created. Uh, but holy people of God spake, uh, King James Version, sorry, that's the way I memorized it, spoke as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. So it's this idea that God superintended what was revealed in Scripture. So what you have in, um, in the Bible, as opposed to uh, what you might have in the, the Quran or the Book of Mormon, where you have one person that is writing down all of what they, um, you know, in quotations, have received from God, what you have in the Old Testament, New Testament Scriptures is 40 different authors writing over the period of 1,600 years, um, and they're all saying the same storyline, or the, the whole thing fits together, if you will. Uh, from the book of Genesis, Moses writes in uh, Genesis chapter 3 that uh, there's a, the prophecy that there's a, a, a child is going to be born uh, to the woman, and he is going to... Uh, uh, that Satan is going to bruise his heel, uh, and uh, the child is going to crush Satan's head. And then you get to Genesis chapter 12, and here comes this promise to Abraham. There's going to be a child that's going to be born. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people like to look at uh, Genesis and, and think to themselves, like, these are, this book has uh, all the details of how everything began. And I like to look at Genesis as like, this is how sin came into the world, um, literally through a person. Um, but the focus has always been on the child through whom uh, the blessing to the world was promised. And so Genesis 12, you get to Genesis uh, chapter 17. Then you move in through uh, the Exodus. And here's this storyline of this child who's coming, this child who's coming, Daniel there's this Savior who's coming. You get into the Psalms. Uh, there, there's this, this guy who was pierced for our transgressions, uh, bruised for our iniquities. Isaiah prophesies of uh, this Savior. And uh, then Matthew chapter 1. Um, Jesus Christ comes onto the scene. The Word became flesh, um, and we have beheld his glory. Glory as the only Son begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Old Testament canon those 37 uh, books of the Old Testament were put together. And um, so when Jesus comes onto the scene, those Old Testament books were already assumed to have been revealed by God. That canon or that, um, um, th that set of books had been uh, not chosen uh, as uh, you would think the Da Vinci Code taught us, or, you know, if anybody saw Tom Hanks' worst film, I don't, I'd never even seen it, I can't even say, I don't know. I forgot the camera. Um, so, yeah, the Da Vinci Code sort of talks about how, like, people chose these different books, and um, I like to think that, uh, and what I do, I do just inherently believe, that the New Testament and Old Testament scriptures were put together in response to, like, th these other books or, or whatever other things that are out there, like, they're just not the same. There, there's another level of something uh, with these books. And so when you look at um, the Gospel of Thomas, for instance, that everybody, like, basically, if you, I, I like to boil the argument down to, 
if we were to look at the Gospel of Thomas, which is probably the, the one book of the scriptures that people are like, man, that book ought to be in this Bible. That, that, why isn't the Gospel of Thomas in, uh, in the Bible? If you were to go read through the Gospel of Thomas, what you see at the last paragraph of the Gospel of Thomas, it says that a woman should become a man so that she can uh, receive salvation. Uh, and I don't, I don't know about the ladies in the room, um, uh, but that's just, that's not the Bible. That's not scripture. That's uh, what, what scripture does is it, is it subverts the culture and exalts women uh, to equality in a society that it wasn't. And essentially uh, what the B Gospel of Thomas is saying um, is what we would call uh, Gnosticism. So when you look at the New Testament scriptures and you see Paul writing to combat certain false teachings in the New Testament, essentially one of the things that's going on is that people are coming up with other teaching. Um, and uh, a big part of that is the Gnostic teaching. And then around 200 AD, there's a lot of other things that start to come out. Gospel of Thomas. So when you look at the New Testament scriptures, all of the books that were compiled were compiled uh, in the time period that the apostles lived. So some of the books that they argue that these books should be a part of the New Testament, those books came after any of the apostles lived. And if you were to really study them, they have Gnostic teaching. Basically, the physical world is bad, the spiritual world is good, and, um, and yet what you see Paul talk about in 1 Corinthians 15 is that if Jesus did not physically raise from the dead, he says, then we're still in our sins, like we're stuck in sin. So oftentimes when it comes to like the conspiracy theory of why certain books didn't make it into the Bible, it's like, man, you just haven't really studied the Bible. Like you, you just really haven't looked at uh, the distinct teachings of the scripture versus uh, comparing it with, with Gnosticism um, or some other false teaching. And, and what the Apostle Paul often is doing in the New Testament is essentially arguing against what these books would later come and argue for. And then we come 2,000 years later and say, why didn't, why didn't y'all put that in, why didn't y'all put that in the Bible? Well, it's because Paul said, don't put it in the Bible. It's because Paul spent most of his time saying this is dumb. Um, anyways, that's my synopsis of the canon of scripture. So how does God reveal, uh, reveal himself? And this is, there, there's, what we're going to talk about in, in essence and what what uh, R.C. Sproul talks about are the communicable attributes of God and the in incommunicable attributes of God. And essentially, the communicable attributes of God is just a fancy way of saying uh, these are attributes that you and I share with God. Like he has these characteristics too. Uh, we're made in his image. He has these characteristics along with us. Um, and then the incommunicable attributes of God are characteristics or attributes of God that we don't share. Like uh, omnipotence, which uh, is just a big word for all, being all-powerful, we don't share that characteristic with God, but God has it. Omniscience, uh, God knows everything. Um, we don't share that characteristic with God, but God has Those are incommunicable attributes. Um, and so I, I really feel like R.C. Sproul does a good job of uh, explaining those things, and those will be really helpful for you. Um, somebody grab Acts 17 and verse 26 for me. This is going to continue to communicate um, yeah, just the nature of how God has revealed him. If God does exist, then how did he reveal himself? Somebody get, grab uh, Acts 17.26. Somebody get for me Acts 17.25, please. Romans 1.20. Actually, let's just read Acts 17, 24 through 28 in Romans 1 20. Who's got Acts 17, 
24 through 28. Would you go ahead and just read it to us? Thank you. Romans one twenty. For for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. All right, so here are a couple of the characteristics that are revealed in uh, in those short passages of scripture. So God is one, uh, God is the creator. Uh, God is eternal and independent. God is invisible and powerful. God, though distinct from the universe, is active in it. God sustains all things. Somebody grab Romans one thirty two for me. So God is moral. He is the ultimate source of uh, of our values. So that's some of the characteristics of the way that he's been revealed through special revelation. So general revelation, meaning the uh, creation, uh, cannot tell us that about God. But the way that God reveals himself in the scripture uh, reveals that about God. So I, I want to give us some time to ask questions. Um, and chat a, a little more if there's something about a coworker at work that what if this comes up or just a question that you have, maybe even like a pushback, like help me understand this better kind of a thing. One of the things about the way that God has revealed himself in scripture that I think is incredibly important um, is that God is three and yet one. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that we hang out there for a second uh, this morning, would somebody grab Deuteronomy 6 and 4 and Isaiah 45 and 5, Isaiah 45 and 21? Deuteronomy 6-4? Yes. Isaiah 45, 5. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me. And then 45, 21. Of Isaiah. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told this long ago? Who declared it? Who declared it of old? So in essence, what uh, is revealed in the Old Testament scriptures is um, is where um, the roots of uh, Islam understands this about God, uh, Ju Judaism understands this about God, and Christianity in a subtly different way understands this about God. Uh, we are monotheists meaning that we believe that there is one God. Uh, now, the way that that is um, revealed in Scripture to us is that God is one, and yet God is, exists in three persons together in full communion with himself. So, um, if you would, pull up Matthew 6, 9 through 13, Romans 15 and 6, and 1 Peter 1. One three.
And go ahead, just read them, read them out loud once you get there. Uh, Matthew 6, 9 through 13, Romans 15 and 6, and 1 Peter 1, 3. So speaking directly of the Father, uh, Jesus says pray and acknowledges that the Father is God. Romans 15 and 6. So there's the Father who uh, is God that Paul says. 1 Peter 1, 3. So I think we all get that. Uh, I, I even think that our uh, Jewish and uh, Islamic uh, friends would, would say, yeah, God is one. The Father is one. That's God. Um, um, now, somebody pull up for me John 1, 1 through 4. Isaiah 9, 6. Titus 2.13 and Romans 9 and verse 5. This is where it gets sticky. Titus 2.13. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans 9 and 5. All right, so you see from Old Testament, Isaiah, uh, Gospel of John, New Testament, Epistle, Romans, and Titus, speaking of Jesus being, uh, being God, or the Christ being God. Now let's look at Psalm 139, verse 7, Acts 5, 3, and 4, and then 1 Corinthians 2, 11, and 12. Acts 5, 3, and 4. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. Pause there. Notice that he says, you lied to the Holy Spirit when he, f he first started talking, then he turns and says, you have not lied to, to man, you've lied to God. Uh, so he, he likens the Holy Spirit to God himself. First Corinthians 2, verses 11 and 12. So 
the way that scripture has uh, has articulated or revealed to us in special revelation the nature and character of God, one of those attributes or characteristics is what uh, Christians call the Trinity, uh, that God uh, is one and yet he is three persons. Now, this has been the most helpful uh, thing for me to understand the Trinity. I, I've had a couple of conversations with uh, Muslim uh, Uber drivers over the course of time, and they cannot fathom the idea of God being a Trinity, and um, and and this is this is how like I this is what I love about Christianity that um, maybe it's not able to be understood by everybody, and and something like this, right? It just it doesn't it you know it it doesn't for our post enlightenment minds it's like black and white, give me, give me this plus this has to equal this, and something like the idea of, of Trinity is, is very abstract, and that's okay, um, but one of the things that I think is beautiful about God being three in one um, is that it's not out of his loneliness that he creates you and me. It's not uh, one, one of the characteristics of God that R.C. Sproul talks about, that God is completely self-sufficient, meaning he needs nothing and no one. He uh, is completely sufficient in and of himself on his own. Uh, and it is out of the overflow of who he is that he creates uh, you and me. So in the book of Genesis, uh, it says uh, that God said, let us make man in uh, in our image, right? And so if you trace the scriptures talking to the spirit as God, the son as God, and, uh, and the father as God, what you get to see is that every uh, person in the Trinity is functioning in our own salvation, um, in what it takes for us to be made right with God. And so the... Uh, so the picture of love itself, right? The scripture says that God is love. How can God be love if there's nothing uh, outside of himself that he loves, right? But if God is triune uh, and he creates us in his image, then that means that God, based on what the scripture revealed, has been giving and receiving love within himself from all eternity past. So then when he creates us in his image, then we become an overflow of the giving and receiving of a God who's been giving and receiving love with, within himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from eternity past. So then we get a picture of what it means to live in community with other people, whether husband or wife or friendship with other people and our need for other people based on the fact that we're made in the image of God and God God literally exists in community within himself. Um, so it helps me understand what love is by understanding that when scripture says God is love, that literally he, he creates out of the overflow of who he is uh, the, the nature of what love actually looks like. So if God isn't triune, then how, how, is, how is he able to be love? I don't know. Maybe that's uh, mental gymnastics. I don't know. But when it comes to our salvation, so many of us think of uh, being made right with God, being declared righteous, as we've been talking about throughout the book of Romans, uh, being justified, which uh, means to be declared right with God by faith in Jesus, right? What Jesus has come to do, uh, which is live a perfect life that we couldn't live, die sacrificially in our place, and rise from the dead, and through faith in that, then we get to experience salvation. But what happens in that is that the process of salvation is this being brought back into the divine community. So when you become a follower of Jesus, it's not that now all of a sudden you've just been declared right with God. Um, and it's, it's, not that, um, it's not that now you and God are cool, like, like 
All right. I, I, yeah, the scripture does say there's like we've had I have peace with God. Um, but it's that Christ is now in you. And you are in Christ. So when God created Adam in his image and uh, and he had relationship with Adam, uh, he had connection to Adam, he had communion with Adam, what happens in our salvation after that, uh, that separation has been made through sin. Now, God doesn't just declare you right. He brings you into the divine community of himself. So now Christ is in you, you are in Christ, and you get to experience the operation of what God has been doing from eternity past, giving and receiving love. And our being made right with him is through uh, or our being sanctified in him or being made more and more into the image of Jesus happens as we grow in intimacy and closeness and community with God. And so as much as like you might have heard of, you know, three eggs and something to explain the Trinity and a bunch of different metaphors to explain the Trinity, not like they all fall apart, right? They're, they're all... But when you think of it in terms of our salvation um, and you think of it in terms of like what we're saved for, not just what we're saved from, but like what, what I'm saved to experience. That's when I think the Trinity really comes alive. That, that's when you really get to be like, wait a second, like God is right here right now. Like when I go to, uh, I don't know, when, in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, Paul is talking about how we were, uh, um, were a part of the, the body of, of Christ, right? And why would you make, uh, if, if Jesus is in you and you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, like, would you, like, basically he makes the argument based on our union with Jesus to not participate in sexual immorality. And his point being is that, like, literally you've been brought into the divine community and you're experiencing intimacy and love and the sharing of what God has been doing over the course of, uh, of eternity past right now. That is available to you right now. Why, why, would, you, why would you do something to, uh, I don't know, to, to what's, what's the word people use about the Holy Spirit? Uh, why would you, um, I don't know, why would you mess that up? Not that you would lose it. Jackson says, what, you know, he used the milk illustration on Sunday, the chocolate milk illustration. Um, what, why, would you, why would you do something to mess up what you're experiencing through being brought into the, into the divine community? So if, and when I'm at work, the beauty of God being triune uh, comes to play when I realize, like, now I'm not just... I'm not just declared right, but like God's with me right now. And the, the beauty of, of the nature of how God has revealed himself is that the scripture says in Ephesians 1.13 that I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, we're going to walk through all of the distinctions of, of um, living or life in the Spirit, that we've been adopted as sons and daughters of God, and the Spirit cries out, Abba, Father. And so often, you know, the voice of the world or the voice of our own negative self-talk or the voice of uh, what other people think that we ought to do in our lives becomes incredibly loud, and we miss the voice of the Spirit of God saying, secure, approve, belong, you're, you're a child of God. And what Paul is articulating in Romans 8 is that like, hey, you've been called to experience the beauty of the divine community. Uh, you've been brought into that uh, through the saving work of, of Jesus Christ. And um, so I just, I, if you, and, and one of the things that I think so often we do is we miss the work of the Holy Spirit. And I've been, I've been talking about this uh, quite often. Um, but if the Holy Spirit's work is to exalt the person and work of Jesus, then he's always perpetually and continually saying that by faith, uh, through the grace of the person and work of Jesus, we are secure, we belong, uh, we're 
the beloved of God. And we're able to experience that because God is triune. Um, and so it's, it's just important. Um, and we're not able to fully experience our union with Jesus if we're really unfamiliar with the work of the Holy Spirit. All right. There are, the Bible assumes that God uh, exists, uh, says essentially we, we just worship and serve other created things. We suppress that. Uh, but there's other arguments for the existence of God. I believe the moral argument and the teleological argument are uh, ones that come up, practically speaking, pretty often. Um, and, and then if God does exist, then what is he like um, in that we receive special revelation from God? We have the general revelation of creation, but then the special revelation uh, of his word in Scripture and that reveals to us what, what he's like and, uh, and his characteristics. And there are communicable attributes uh, that we share, that, uh, that God has, that we have. He's, he loves and, and, and we're able to love. There, there are certain things that he feels that, that we feel. And there are incommunicable attributes, which are attributes that he has that we don't have. We're not omnipotent. We are not uh, omnipresent. We can't be everywhere at once, but he is. Uh, we're not omniscient. We don't know all things, uh, and, and yet he is. So that is the way that he has revealed himself is in Scripture. And one of the distinct attributes in Christianity um, that is really important to our own experience of God and salvation is that God is three persons and one as revealed in Scripture. Questions? Uh, Cam? Um, I agree. I think that incommunicable and communicable arguments that relevant to Scripture. And we've talked a lot about, um, you, know, you and I have talked about how this, like, letting go of this post enlightenment, like, need to understand the Trinity helped me come to faith. How, how do you, what's the two sentence or three sentence theological explanation of us being? So like anthrop he may may use the word anthropomorphic uh description. Um that's a good question, Cam. <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate that. So give it to me one more time and I'll see well, the I best I can. Yeah, I would I would say uh, more so I would say in the sense of like we're made in God God's image and the Trinity shows us how we're made for relationship and community with other people. Um, and that experience of God being three in one is the reason why we even care about marriage uh, be, because it's a reflection of the image of God and we are created in, in his image. Um, stuff like that. So there are certain things that we absolutely, you know, there are certain things about God that are distinct, and yet there are certain characteristics uh, of him that are, are very much familiar to the human experience, namely our need and desire for relationship and community. Michelle? I have no idea. I have not studied it. If you do, do you do you have do you know it well enough to be like this is what people are saying? Do you have the answer to that?
God bless you. Okay. Yeah. So why was that? And Thomas was an apostle. Like why was that's that? a wonderful question. Um, that's a wonderful question. The way that I that I read uh, Galatians in that particular generation is that the only people who were allowed to receive an inheritance would be firstborn sons, and so. It's not like, I guess in one sense, it's not like you transformed into becoming a man, um, but you're receiving the firstborn inheritance as described in the first century as though you were. Um, and I, I think if, if you were to like really read through the Gospel of Thomas, uh, you would see like there's stuff about the material world that's wrong, and there's stuff about... Uh, gender that gets really distinct from even what Paul would say in Galatians. So maybe a, a poor distillation of the Gospel of Thomas, but if you were to read it, um, I, I just, yeah, you could go through chapter by chapter and be like, yeah, that's, that doesn't fit with the distinct doctrines of Christianity. Back at the back. Yeah, I, I would say that they're, they're probably distinct. Um, I, I think the traditional argument is that, uh, like, for instance, if, um, I don't know, if I said, um, if I, I said I had a word of knowledge uh, uh, for Ryan, and I said, Ryan, I, there's this thing that I know that I feel like God has placed on my heart to share with you. Um, I would see that as distinct from special revelation in the sense of what scripture is and uh, just like a word of encouragement to Ryan from the spirit that is affirmed by the scripture. Um, so if I have uh, a special anything, right, I would want to go back to the scripture and make sure what has specifically been revealed about God lines up with uh, with what I have uh, sensed the Spirit telling me to tell to Ryan. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just think that we all have to be really careful with that. But I would just see as, like, once the canon of Scripture was complete, um, the need for uh, special revelation in terms of other stuff to know about God um, we, we, don't, we don't need until we get to the other side of heaven. And yet there's certain things that God could gift in, from the Holy Spirit to a specific person. I still believe in that stuff. I don't know about everybody else. Um, so follow up question. Yes. As far as the Old Testament goes then, when the Lord revealed himself to Elizabeth the prophet, was that since like, the person wasn't canonized? Yeah. Yes. Was oh special revelation? Yeah, I, I would say, man, I don't want to get into. I'm not a systematic theologian in terms of the specificity of what a theological scholar would actually say. But like, you know, when I think of what God revealed to Moses in the the Ten Commandments, um, I think those think of those things as uh, special revelation that God revealed. Uh, for him and that he recorded for us. Yeah. A system, like an actual systematician might be like, Steve, you're crazy. <laughs> I don't know. What else? Mr. Robert? Yeah.
Yeah. I would say, so I would say, I don't know this specifically how they uh, view this, but I would say that just like in any language, there is not, um, like if we were to be speaking Spanish right now, right? There are certain words um, that don't perfectly translate over to another language. And um, I, I would just say that regardless of how it was articulated, they probably theologically just said that can't be, it can't be plural in that way. It can't be, he can't literally mean uh, us. It must be like some word that, like, just like when God says uh, in Exodus 3, 3 and 4, uh, and Moses asks uh, God, who will I say sent me? And he says, tell him I am who I am sent you, right? There's, there's a certain level at which, like, what does that even mean? Um, and, you know, I think that it clearly means that, like, the, I'm self-existent, like the I'm the uncreated creator of all creation. Like I I don't I don't nobody speaks for me or represents me. I represent myself. Um, and yet, like I think in lang in language, there are times where it can be really difficult to understand. So I think that based on what we know to be true from the New Testament, that becomes really easy for us to look at the pr plural. Uh, pronoun there and say, oh, that that's what he meant. Um, but I think translators in in uh, ancient Hebrew just assume that it, it couldn't have meant that. That's the best answer I got, man. An Old Testament scholar would be able to tell you something much better than that. What else? Christine? Okay. My, all right, so this is, I don't have a great one. Th my go-to is uh, Genesis 17, uh, Abraham and Isaac, because that's in the Quran. It's Ishmael in the Quran. And, and just saying, like, if that was Isaac, is that not a picture of what God was going to do? to his son, but he provided the scapegoat in the ram in the bush. Because they identify, like that's a story that that is a part of the Quran. So um, I typically won't get in the full throttle of, of the Trinity with a Muslim person. I more so want to talk about the sacrifice of Christ for our sins. That's, that's what I go to. What else? Yes, Michelle. Yeah, I think one of the things that's really helpful, and it, this goes back to just all of what we, we've studied uh, this morning, is that how is God, how do you know that God has revealed himself? Like the things that you know about being a follower of Christ and uh, loving and walking with God, how does that compare to what you're reading? Um, and does it line up? Does it not line up? My brain kind of works that way. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, I kind of approach things like, what is distinct about this that's different? Or what rises off of the page to me, um, even as I'm trying to give a, a fair reading to something, is like, what, what is, what is, what is popping up? What is, what is uh, something that that I know is distinct from the way that God has revealed himself or 
not even not even what I know, uh, what sounds a little bit distinct from what I know uh, that the way that God has revealed himself in scripture. Um, that my antenna, I guess, is always is always up to 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 what might be distinct. And, and that's why I think whenever you read anything, um, there needs to be a part of you that's not just consuming um, what you're reading, but discerning as well. Like that's actively uh, mentally engaged um, and not just passively absorbing. So uh, approach it with a certain posture when you read the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, approach it with a certain uh, level of uh, discernment when, uh, when it's the book of uh, Enoch. What have uh, other faithful people said over the course of his history uh, about these particular writings? Um, I find those things to be helpful. What else? Yes. I, I think it, it has to pertain to, like, the posture of, uh, of your heart, right? So there may be times when you come to something that you don't like in the Bible, um, but there's still other parts of the Scripture that you know to be true about God's love and God's compassion towards you, and those things are helpful reminders that you know to be true that help you obey the things that are really difficult or really hard. And so uh, there's certain things, and I, I don't know, I'm imagining, imagining certain Old Testament passages being like, what, what in the world is going on that's being allowed? And so there are certain things that I try to remember as I'm reading scripture. And actually, this is really important. Um, this is really important. As much as this is a systematic theology class, in other words, we are trying to organize the teachings of the scriptures into one succinct th uh, sort of idea. And yet the Bible was written to an original audience that had original hearers. And so whenever you read the scripture, you need to remember that there are certain things about your culture and your uh, perspective that were a complete foreign concept in that particular time period and that particular uh, season of history. And there are certain things that the Apostle Paul says some of the most uh, liberating things uh, that can be said uh, and yet, at the same time, he says some of uh, the most uncomfortable things that can be said if we read it strictly from a 21st century Western American perspective. 
and um, and so the goal of this class is to uh, palm your Bible. Essentially, what we're tr what what we're trying to do in systematic theology is uh, I now I'm realizing everybody's not a basketball player. Um, <laughs> When you're, when you were a kid, when I was a kid, the thing that like, it, it was like you really had grown when you were able to, to palm a, a basketball. Like your hand was big enough to actually hold the ball in your hand. Some of y'all might remember Michael Jordan had some, some moves where he'd like pull the ball back with one hand. Um, and the goal of systematic theology is for you to be able to have a good understanding of all of what the scripture has revealed about God. That being said, there are things uh, when it comes to interpreting the Bible that I would say we just did popcorn scripture with all of those different passages. I would say Paul has an original audience that he's considering. Um, there's, uh, uh, there are circumstances that he's responding to. Like, I wouldn't read a text message, I, I say this sometimes, I wouldn't read a text message that I sent to Rachel and say, this is what it means to me, if, if I'm you, right? You would, you would say, but by nature of, like, knowing, uh, like, I, like, I'm not the person that this was originally written to, that there's a context that I need to better understand in order to approach uh, the scripture in this way. So... That's really, really important with whatever, you know, the James study that's going on on Saturdays. Like, that's something that is, like, that, the, that we're trying to do in, in, a, in such a way that helps us understand there's a context, there's a background, there's a connection to each one of these. And the same thing with the book of Romans is that every time we walk through the book of Romans, I'm trying to, before I do the system, systematizing of things from Genesis to Revelation, I'm saying, what did Paul mean right now in this situation when he's writing to this person? And it could be that, like, he says something uh, earlier on uh, in Galatians to the church at Galatia that's very similar to this in how do those things compare so that we understand the context of what's happening before I compare it to anything else. And then if something is really difficult in Scripture, then I move to compare Scripture with Scripture. So what is what does the scripture say in this other part of the, of, the, of the Bible that compares to this thing that's unclear to me in this part of the Bible? And um, I, I say that just to say that there's, in the process of like what this class is, is helping us do is to get us the full scope of the teachings of scripture, but we're not doing the work of pressing out the context of each passage with its original audience and its original circumstances and the, the details of what the relationship that Paul has with those particular people. And that's one of the distinctness, distinctnesses of like special revelation in general is that like something that was written originally to a particular audience actually has this grand scope that it wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. Um, that steps outside of space and or outside of space and time and and is meaningful for the all for the through the span of human history kind of a thing does that is that helpful at all okay what else i'm not the exhaustive authority on any of these things either so i'm sure somebody else said it way better and more clearly All right, well, um, let me pray. I'll pray for us out for those who need to bounce. And if you got a question that you wanted to still ask or you forgot in the moment, just come up and uh, ask me. Uh, Heavenly Father, man, there's so much uh, to talk about. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the things that we didn't get to talk, to, talk about is uh, uh, your incomprehensibility and the inexhaustive, uh, uh, the inexhaustive, uh, inexhaustiveness of God, that we can't know everything that there is to know about you because we're finite. And one of the beauties of our salvation is that as we get to know you more and more, we realize how much more there is to know. Um, and 
what you saved us for, uh, to uh, experience you in intimacy. And the beauty of the storyline of our existence is that there's always more to know and always more to experience, always more love to give, always more intimacy to, uh, to live. And so, God, I pray as we get ready to head off to whatever we're doing this morning, uh, going to work and different things, that we would remember by faith in Christ that uh, we have been brought into the divine community, that Christ is in us, and we're in Christ by grace through faith. We thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.